Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine, plus global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. We know this is a market environment that moves from economic data point to economic data point. And we also know that not all economic data point or data is treated equally by investors, nor economists, nor the Fed for that matter, Tim. Well, this week, though, we do have a few that are watched by all as we get two reads on inflation just over the next two days. Also a read on retail sales on Friday, throw in some jobless claims, Carol. The Fed is watching the U.S. labor market closely. All this could make for an interesting week. And then... Michael McKee next week goes off to Jackson Hole. Right. So we hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. We'll see what he has to say, yeah. how that shapes the narrative. All right, so let's get to it. With us, our roundtable, Bloomberg News Economics Editor Molly Smith, uh, along with Bloomberg Economics U.S. Economist Stuart Paul. Stuart here in studio, Molly on Zoom here in New York City. And so let's get to it. So we do, first of all, Molly, lay it out for us and what matters. Um, and it's actually, forgive me, I think... There's three inflation reports, although I'm not quite sure the New York Fed one year inflation expectations. It it already came out. There's two more, though, coming our way over the next couple of days. Um, What matters? Yeah, I mean, it's really just going to be CPI, the consumer price index and full focus that comes out on Wednesday this week. And we also get a look at producer prices. So this is a level of wholesale inflation that comes out on Tuesday. Uh, Obviously, the CPI is one of, if not the biggest market moving events in any given month. And I don't think that this will necessarily be too much different from that, but hopefully we won't see nearly the same reaction that we did to the jobs report that you guys mentioned just two weeks ago. Uh, Pretty fast and furious moves in stocks and treasuries on that front. And I think this one is, I think people are maybe just looking for, okay, let's just get through this. Hopefully it's a fairly as expected reading. Maybe inflation is going to pick up a little bit relative to June, but the broader trend of disinflation is still going to be intact. And I think something like that will just bring, hopefully, a reassuring calm to the market. But that said, it doesn't take that much to tip the scales these days. Like Everybody is just very jittery about the data right now. Well, uh, Stuart, come on in here. Let's talk CPI before we talk PPI here, because you and the team over at Bloomberg Economics argue that July CPI will likely be soft, with the year-over-year change in core CPI edging further down. Take us into your thinking and what you're modeling. So we have a few factors that are going on. First is that the most interest sensitive categories, things like used autos, are exerting meaningful drag on both core and headline inflation. We have some pretty tame numbers for gasoline, so Mm. it's not really boosting the headline all that much. Uh, And then if we look at some of the more discretionary services categories, things like airfares, things like hotels, we're expecting to see some pretty meaningful drag on the core. The thing that's going to matter. We've heard that from the earnings front, the earnings picture, whether it was airlines, whether it was Airbnb. I mean, Expedia, nonetheless, their stock rally because there was a beat, but there everybody's talking about softness in the travel sector. That's right. It's really some of those more discretionary services categories where consumers are tightening their belt. We expect to see the same thing in the retail sales number this week. We expect to see folks really looking for discounts and doing some online bargain hunting as opposed to splurging on food services and some more of the interest sensitive items like appliances and autos even though we will get some auto spending after last month the june uh, cyber attack on auto dealers Mm. but on the inflation front uh, it's interesting this is a one of those peculiar months where we get ppi ahead of cpi Mm. and we're expecting to see more softness in the headline ppi number than in cpi so to molly's point about folks wanting to take a deep breath it's possible that when they see the monthly pace of producer prices ticking down. So when we see producer price inflation, which is 0.2% on the month instead of 04 as they saw last month, folks might breathe that sigh of relief. It might be a little bit too early when they then see the headline pace of CPI increase on the month. So the, mm-hmm. this is one of those peculiar months where the timing of the data has the opportunity to both lull people into a sense of complacency and then give a little bit of a whipsaw mm-hmm. just the next day. Well, Molly, what matters in terms of like, help me through the supply chain, right? PPI or the input, input prices, right? So is that something then will show up in next month's CPI report? Like how do you kind of distinguish those two, two pieces of data? So generally, when the reason why you would, as a typical person, care about the PPI is because 
what's happening at the producer price level tends to filter through to consumers over time. Over time doesn't necessarily mean one month, though. These are trends that can take more than that to more time than that to develop. And of course, movements through the supply chain are not always that quick. But it's, of course, like really important to look at for the overall inflation trend, especially, uh, you know, when you're looking at what's happening with commodity prices. And so many of those have been really wild over the summer with looking at what prices are for coffee and chocolate and other kinds of metals and like things like that, that just, you know, maybe you as a consumer aren't purchasing that as a raw good. But when you purchase it as a final product, then you start to notice how expensive, how expensive those goods can be. Stuart, come on in because I don't know about you guys, but I was gone last week and I even though I wasn't, you know, glued to my phone, we, I could we were still, here. I could still hear people <laughs> screaming about a fifty basis point rate cut. Oh wait, no, you mean the over, emerg- the emergency rate yeah, cut? Yeah, the emergency the seventy five basis points wasn't. There was it that, seventy uh, that's right. I forget who was it that um uh, Siegel? Jeremy Siegel was calling for. So a lot has changed in just a few days. I don't hear those echoes right now. And certainly went away we did not pretty see, quickly, actually. We didn't see one of those emergency rate cuts come from the Fed, but could we get a not necessarily a reaction, but could we get calls for some sort of movement from the Fed based on the data moving one way or the other this week, Stuart? I think that this week is going to be one of those odd weeks where you feel a little bit more stagflation risk as opposed to just outright recession risk. So, mm-hmm. and, and I think that uh, because equity markets have recovered, because the feed through into credit, mar- into credit markets, you know, when it comes to uh, interest rate spreads, when it comes to default risk, we haven't seen any sort of material move there. So I think that when it comes to what we're going to see this week and how it shapes the narrative, it's going to be more so around the idea of stagflation. We're going to see uh, inflation that isn't as, inflation data that aren't as good as they've been in the last three months. Mm. We're going to see retail sales data that when you look deeper in the core, it's going to be pretty dismal. I think that looking at the control group for retail sales, it's going to be pretty rough and we're going to see a 0.2% decline in the month and manufacturing data to round out the week, I also expect that we're going to see a decline, about 0.3% month-on-month decline in manufacturing output. So we're not going to have as good inflation data, and some of the other fundamental concepts are going to show some weakness, and that could be enough to just keep folks on edge having this 50 basis point, 25 basis point debate for another month. Which makes me want to jump to, and I want to ask both of you, and let me, Molly, let me start with you. So are more people starting to talk about a recession, and that if we get a recession, that you know, if the Fed possibly is behind the curve uh, in terms of maybe sparking some growth or catching that we're slowing down maybe faster than we anticipated, could it be a deeper recession? More people definitely are talking about recession since that jobs report came out two weeks ago. We've seen JP Morgan and Goldman economists both boost their likelihood of a recession in the next 12 months. So I'm I'm pretty sure both of them are still below 50 percent. So still fairly low odds. Um, And I think those are the only two that I'm really aware of who have come out and boosted those odds in recent weeks. But right. I don't I'm not that really hearing that it would be the that it would make a recession any deeper. I think it's just now looking at is the Fed behind the curve, like you said, that people are wondering that. And of course, if you get more inflation data that comes in softer than expected, that's only just going to you know add fuel to that argument. Stuart, remind us where you guys are, the team on when it comes to recession. So we've been we've been noting that there has been a material slowdown in some of the underlying factors driving growth for a long time. We've also been noting that, you know, again, even if you just look at the Q2 GDP data, mm-hmm. uh, about a quarter of the growth that we saw was from inventory accumulation that folks in firms aren't trying to accumulate inventories. It's just that they're accidentally producing more on the expectation of resilient consumer demand that just isn't there. And so we think that the Fed is behind the curve. Uh, and we do think that some of the recession, uh, some of the recession probabilities that have been assigned are probably a smidge too low. But we've always been a little bit more bearish, expecting a four and a half percent unemployment rate by year end. And uh, if we continue along this trajectory that we mm. saw in the last month, we'll hit it or exceed it. It's interesting because you guys have been for a long time and it, at a time when it almost felt like, really, can you still be calling this? And now it starts to feel like things are falling into place. Um, guys, perfect setup for us on this Monday. Bloomberg News Economics Editor Molly Smith, along with uh, Bloomberg Economics U.S. Economist right here in studio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. 
Now we got to talk, take all of this together, Tim, and talk about the Treasury and rates market trade. Yeah, um, among our most read stories on the Bloomberg on this Monday in August, how bonds are back as a hedge after failing investors for years. Finally, contributing to this story, Bloomberg News rates reporter Michael McKenzie. He ended last week with us, and now he kicks off, Carol, the week for us. <laughs> Welcome back. You can't get away from us. He tries. Okay. He works from home to try to get away from us, and we still make him turn on the camera and come hang out with us. So Tim was away, and he yes. did read in. Oh, yeah. But so what All did caught he, up. He missed nothing, right? Yeah, we're violently unchanged. <laughs> violently unchanged. That's a good way to describe the week. How are you thinking about uh, uh, things on this Monday here? Uh, we're pretty much, it's interesting too, because we've got the two year yield right there on 4%, 10 years at what, 390. So if you think last week we got as low, we got below 380 on 10s and we bounced back to 4%, to just shy of 4% on Thursday after that very weak 10 year auction. So we're back in the middle of the range. And I think the market's just parked here waiting for what will be, I think, the most important week for data until we get the payrolls report the first week of September. We've got PPI tomorrow, CPI, and then retail sales and jobless claims. So we're going to see whether or not inflation is trending uh, down or whether it's actually going to be proved to be stickier than people are expecting in the bond market. That will put pressure on that front end. Uh, you should see higher yields if inflation is stickier than people anticipate. That said, if inflation comes in online, bang in line with the expectations, then I think the, the focus will turn to, okay, how is the consumer looking for retail sales? And are we seeing any signs of weakness in those initial weekly jobless claims on Thursday? Of the data points that you just mentioned, of all the economic data that we're getting this week, Michael, which one do you think has the biggest implications for the rates curve? I'd say CPI. If CPI is, is trending in the right direction, that means the bond market can go, right, this is yesterday's story, and let's just focus on the consumer and the labor market. You get that all clear on CPI for this month. Uh, I actually love the last month, since it's coming out this month. Um, that means the focus on the Fed's dual mandate, the labor side of things, becomes really, really important out of the bond market. And they'll continue then to really watch carefully for any signs of sort of labor deterioration. You know, we mentioned in the lead in to you, Michael, about this story that's among the most read on the Bloomberg about bonds are back mm -hmm. as a hedge after failing investors for years. We mentioned on Friday in our conversation with you how you had caught up with Dan Iveson, the world's biggest active bond fund manager, um, who mm -hmm. says he's just about ready to start adding to his treasury positions again. Um, you talked to a lot of investors, big bond investors. Are you increasingly seeing that among them that they're getting ready to buy or are already buying? They're already long. I mean, if you look at all the positioning surveys and in PIMCO's defense, when two year was back above 5% briefly late April, they were buying. Mm -hmm. So they, all they've done is they've moderate their duration. They pulled it back a bit. They're waiting for a backup. So if you get sticky inflation, I think they're going to, the people will come in and they'll cap the rise in yields. Um, but longer term, I mean, PIMCO take, tend to take a three to five year viewpoint of things. So Dan Iverson's point to me was, if you're a long-term investor and you step back, 4% on a 10-year is very attractive. If you, you know, you've got to go back to the middle of the first decade of this century when you had a consistent 10-year around that 4% level. So these are attractive yields for longer-term investors. And it means when you do get a wobble in the equity market, we do get something happening in credit, then that the treasury market you know, reclaims its status as being the defensive asset to hold and it will rally. And I think one of the problems the market's got at the moment is that we had a very extensive haven rally on last a week ago on Monday when the UK yen carry trade was being carried out to some extent. And that's why yields fell so so quickly and so sharply. And you're now having to come back and sort of find an equilibrium. And it seems to me 4% on twos and 390s, maybe 4% on tens seem to be the right levels here. Hey, Michael, before we let you go, um, as we mentioned at the top, you contributed to a story that is among the most read on the Bloomberg Terminal about how bonds are back and increasingly money managers are hearing from clients about investing in bonds. You mm -hmm. talk to professional bond investors each and every day, but talk a little bit about how that's sort of going back to the everyday investor who has their money managed by professionals. Well, I mean, the, the, the important thing for invest, I, mean, I think a lot of people have liked the idea of putting their money in T-bills. You know, what was it? We had T-bill and chill. That was the Jeff Gunlack expression <laughs> last yes. year. 
Um, <laughs> but a lot of big bond investors were telling me back in November, December, look, you've got to take advantage of these treasury yields at 5% because it won't, cash rates won't stay at 5% once the Fed starts to cut again. And I think they're being borne out here. That thesis is being validated. It's taken longer than people thought it would. Don't forget everyone at the beginning of the year thought the Fed would be cutting in March. And to a certain extent, uh, Chair Powell did kind of hint that was coming. But that said, you've now got treasury yields with four, you know, 4% twos and below 4% in tens and fives. So if you're still stuck in cash, you're now sitting on, you know, you've, you've got an opportunity loss here because you could have rolled into a 5% two year back in April. Right, mm. right. Um, 375, uh, 475 on tens back in April. Okay. And again, these bond managers were saying you've got to start thinking about moving yeah. out. So I think, got it. you we, know, now is time. So we, we got, had a record high Mike, in. Michael, we got we got to run. Michael McKenzie, forgive me. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Check your calendars. It was one week ago that we had the market sell off, but it was also one week ago that U.S. District Court Judge Amit Mehta ruled that Google had illegally monopolized the online search market. The decision has serious ramifications for Alphabet's flagship business and tremendous connotations for Apple as well. It's something we've been talking about, uh, Tim, over the past week or so. Yeah, much of the focus has been on what this outcome means for Google's multi-billion dollar payments to Apple that ensure Google is the default search engine across iPhones and iPads. But a more pressing question may be what the case itself signals for the U.S. Department of Justice's separate antitrust lawsuit against Apple. Bottom line, there's always a lot going on when it comes to Apple. And writing about Apple and its cash prospects in new research that is out by him is Bloomberg Intelligence senior technology analyst Anurag Rana. He joins us from Chicago. Happy Monday, Anurag. Uh, you were busy, got some research out over the weekend. Help us make some sense, first of all, in terms of if Alphabet isn't making these payments to Apple, what does it mean in terms of their cash flow and their cash? Because you guys seem, or you seem pretty upbeat about it or at least their yeah, prospects. So, yeah, so if you, if you were to uh, you know wait and see what happens with this particular case, when you look at Apple's core business, it's doing very well, even though the top line is not growing in double digits like it used to a few years ago, but even with five to 7% growth, tight cost control, you know this company is generating enough free cash. I think the biggest thing, what we are trying to point out is, when you look at the other large tech companies, you know somebody like a Microsoft or an AWS, um, they are going to spend billions of dollars over the next few years in order to expand their cl cloud data centers, invest in AI. Uh, but in the case of Apple, I think they are the ones that are going to stand out over the next 12 to 24 months because they are not doing that same level of spending because they don't have that kind of business. Now, the Google case you brought up is an important point, and that's a big risk for Apple. But we're still far away to figure out what the remedies are going to be. As long as there is no binding, if, if Google and Apple can renegotiate and figure out if people get choices, I think there is chances that they can you know, salvage some of that particular $20 billion revenue that comes in. Now, if they are able to, if, if, if the judge comes out and says, well, you cannot pay them anything, then that's a problem. But even in that case, I think it'll be a few years before Apple can make up for that revenue loss. I want to go back to this idea of Apple not having to make those huge CapEx investments in AI like Microsoft and Amazon have to do when it comes to uh, infrastructure and actually building out these facilities on Iraq. Um, is it a risk for Apple that they're partnering instead with other companies that are making these investments and, and not doing them themselves? Uh, is there a chance that they could run into an issue with a platform taking off that's not their own platform? Yeah, see, they're in the device business, in, in all honesty, when you look at the iPhone, they're really not into cloud computing or giving people uh, infrastructure to build their applications. So that's a completely different uh, equation in my view. It's like you know getting electricity. You really don't need to own your own uh, uh, generators in order to get electricity. So when you look at Apple, they're basically saying, in the same case what they have with Google, they don't want to be in that search business. They're gonna go try to get a partnership with anybody who has the best search business right now, and they will put that on their phones. They did that with OpenAI. They went out and talked to a bunch of people and says, who has the best large language model that would work well on their iPhone? 
and they chose up to you know open ai to be one of their partners so that's how that's part of their business model and that's part of the reasons why they don't need to spend that much in capex you know, it's interesting. We talked with David Weston, who is a lawyer and spent a lot of time doing antitrust work uh, specifically. And I do wonder about some of these big technology companies, Anurag, that they are successful at what they do. And is that a crime that just because you're good at what you do? And I was actually having a conversation with uh, one of my sisters this week. and We were talking about Google and I'm like, but do you use, you know, do you try any other kind of search engine? She's like, nope, because Google like just works so well. So like, when is it a crime that you are really good at what you do and you just become big because of that? Like, how do we figure out, you know, when it is an antitrust issue and when it's not? Yeah, I think, see, all these companies are generating billions and billions of dollars of free cash flow, which really will attract a lot of lawyers, as you can imagine. Now, let's say the case of iPhone, if tomorrow, when I turn on my iOS or I install a brand new operating system, it'll ask me which search engine do you want to use. It's going to give me six choices. Mm -hmm. More like, most likely or not, I'll, I'm going to pick Google, and that is going to help Google. I think the bigger question in this all equation is, you know, what happens to that payment that's happening? Well, that's why you know I, I think sort of counterintuitively, couldn't this actually be a great thing for Google <laughs> if people end up using Google? and choosing Google because they're not choosing a competitor, but then Google doesn't have to make these payments to Apple. That's yep. just like icing on the cake. This is a, this could be a big win for Alphabet, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what I'm saying that in this entire you know, case, it's Apple who's going to lose. But here's yeah. my counter argument. Here's my counter argument to that. Apple's a company with, as I said, over 100 billion in free cash flow. If they really wanted to fight Google in search, they can do it. They can go and acquire a small vendor and use that in their pipeline. Remember, they control distribution of 2.2 billion devices. Google's gonna lose a lot of market share if it doesn't play nice with Apple. And, and that, so, you know, I, I get it that in the short term, they will be, um, you could say, benefit from it, but I, th I don't think they would wanna pick a fight with Apple on this one. Interesting. The antitrust case, case, though, against Apple by the Department of Justice, um, they say to classify Apple as a monopolist, the government attorneys carved out its relevant product market is only including premium smartphones, a segment apparently distinct from entry level yeah. and less expensive gadgets. I mean, it's kind of like you're dicing and slicing the market here, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you look at Apple's entire, so there are roughly about f five plus billion smartphones in the world. And Apple's market share is roughly about 20% or 1 billion. But yeah, you could make the argument if it was only the expensive category, you know, they have over 50% of the market share. But there are only two players out there, either it's Samsung or it's Apple. They, you know, there isn't really a big third player in the premium market that anybody wants to deal with. But, you know, we think 20% of the market share in the global uh, smartphone market, that really is the big case for Apple, which is as people become more affluent, they will go out and get Apple because it's an aspirational brand for people in emerging markets, it's really the place you want to be. But in most cases, you don't even qualify to buy that uh, product because it's so expensive. Well, and the thing about, you know, Apple with these large language models and all of the AI that's being, you know, done, I guess, do they not care? Go ahead and everybody else, you spend money, you develop it, and then we'll give you the device that, you, that people can play with it on. Is that what it's all about? Yeah, but in the, you know, if I was to take the other argument of it is, if they started doing everything else, then people will say, well, they're using the distribution to unfairly you know, push their own product. Right. They're basically okay. saying, if you build the best product out there, we will use it, and we will use it on the merit of the product. In this particular case, they didn't go out and pick you know, Google's Gemini on round one. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, there's down the road, I think it may happen, but they chose OpenAI because they have, the, at this point, the best large language model out there. Okay, speaking of the Apple being a device company, it's the iPhone company, no question. <laughs> the iPhone 16, likely we'll see it unveiled in just a few weeks. I was getting ready and thinking really you, hard, so was Paul Sweeney, about yeah? like replacing my phone come later this year, and now I'm thinking maybe I shouldn't. Well, that's the big question, because Mark Gurman out with his Power On newsletter over the weekend on Iraq talking about how this is perhaps one of those stopgap models that gives people a bridge to the next one, perhaps doesn't get people to do an upgrade super cycle. How are you thinking about it at Bloomberg Intelligence? Yeah, in a similar vein, we, we don't think it's going to have a massive layout in year one. Over a three-year period, I think it's going to help. But um, at this point, we, we don't have, we, we are looking at maybe a 5% bump in total unit shipments sold 
next year, FY25 over FY24. And that's because the last two years has been kind of weak. Hmm. The Apple's install by base moves at a certain, certain rate and you refresh your phone when you, to be honest, when the battery runs out. <laughs> that number used to be 3.6 years for a few years, but it's been extended closer to four years at this point. So at an average, globally, out of that one billion small, you know, phones I talked about, people refresh it every four years. So I think that is what we're going to see. We're not going to see a massive bump because of AI. All right, just to wrap up here, uh, as you know, we're over the hump, if you will, in terms of half of 2024 already uh, over. How are you thinking about the rest of the year when it comes to technology in terms of some of the big major themes, whether it's AI, CapEx expending? Are we going to see more kind of worrisome notes or worrisome updates? Or do you feel pretty confident about the rest of the year? See, I think from a fundamental point of view, this is going to be fine. I mean, I don't see any reason why the big tech companies, whether it's Microsoft or whether it's um, you know Amazon Web Services, their core business is strong and it will remain. The stock reaction is a very different game because that depends on interest rates and so many other factors. And that's really, you know, we'll see what happens with that. But at the same time, they will spend that a lot of money in order to beef up their capacity so that they can grow over the next three to five years. I think that is really, in our view, a good long-term play, but in the short term, it may have its ups and downs. All right, got it. Listen, Anurag, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Anurag Rana, he's our Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Technology Analyst, joining us from Chicago. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Carol, I don't know if you caught this article from mm -hmm. Sejal Kishan a few weeks ago. It was about the changing view mm -hmm. of ESG. We've talked about this a lot over the last... 18 we months, have. two years or so. He wrote that, quote, the red carpet is being formally rolled up for the three letters ESG, at least over at II, the 57-year-old organization, has dropped the label, short for Environmental, Social, and Governance, from its annual analyst rankings. Yeah, there's been such pushback against the um, kind of labeling. In its place is sustainability, a synonym many banks and money managers are using instead amid the increasingly politicized debate over climate change and corporate diversity in the United States. What a change if you go back, I feel like 10, 15 years where there's been so much emphasis and a movement towards this ESG labeling. Yeah, curious what Bud Sturmack has to say about all this. He's partner and head of impact investing over at Paragon Wealth Management. He joins us here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. Paragon has about $8 billion in assets under management. Bud, how are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. So you guys are kind of leaning into ESG when others are, are pulling back a little bit. Talk a, talk a little bit about why that is. Yeah, I think um, we're in an era of personalization and whether it's, you know, how we consume television or music or where we buy groceries or what kind of car we drive, I think you're seeing that start to evolve investing. And so what Paragon stands for is empowering our clients with choice. And we think it's important to include in our client onboarding process questions about understanding what values our clients bring to the table. These are values that clients bring to the table. Yes. Talk, what do you mean by that? So, you know, as well as understanding client goals, financial planning, yeah. understanding their investments, what, what do they care about most? Mm. Is it climate change? Is it gender equality? Is it racial equality? If those things are... What if they only care about returns? That's fine. Yeah. And they don't care about any of the other stuff. That's totally okay. But we think it's important in this day and age that we ask the question because it brings a whole nother layer mm. of... Uh, the ability for clients to connect with their portfolio if that's something that they believe passionately about. But, you know, if you build it, they will come, that kind of thinking. So I guess my question is, are your clients still saying, hey, we like this ESG thing. We get it. We understand. We want to commit money to it. The answer is yes. But I also think that you hit on something before, which is people are moving away from the term ESG. So sustainable investing, values-based investing, um, we're not like regularly using the term ESG. Uh, again, I think it comes back to client values. What do they care about most? What, so where did ESG get it wrong? Like what is it that, it's just kind of mind blowing how much time and energy and money we spent talking yeah. about it. And then now it's kind of getting, although things evolve and sometimes things come yeah. out better uh, on the other side. But so what so happened? It's funny because ESG really is research, it's data. Yeah. Um, and the the term sort of got turned into 
investing, which it's really not. It's a tool, right? right. So I think um, it's vulnerabilities, isn't it? Like yeah, you know, it climate can be risks. exposure, it's risks. right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think where it sort of went awry is um, maybe two things. You have on the investing within the investing landscape, you have mutual funds and ETFs that label themselves ESG or sustainable. And when a client is buying into that fund, they're sort of having to adopt whatever the fund manager's view mm -hmm. on sustainability is. The client may agree with that view, they may not. Um, and so then you have the ESG data companies, right? They're taking very complex E, S, and G data, and they're trying to wrap that up into a nice score mm -hmm. that everybody can say, oh, this is a very sustainable company, this is not. Right. The problem with that is, is that the E, S, and the G data, those data points might actually be very accurate and, and succinct, but wrapping them into a nice, neat score invites subjectivity. And so you- Well, would, governance might be easier than environment, like, there, like some of it might be easier to measure than others, right, also. I think that's true, um, but trying to wrap it up into a nice, neat score, yeah. What you're, and the criticism that was invited from that was that, oh, this ESG data company rates Tesla very high while this ESG data company rates it low. And that, you know, this, uh, and it basically brought in criticism right. of, of ESG in general. Right. Well, maybe the E <clears throat> is a positive for some, for some of these in when it comes to data, but the G when it comes to governance and who's on Tesla's board, for example, um, doesn't necessarily pass muster for this other organization. Just for example, I mean, the E, S, and G are three completely different things. That's exactly right. And I think- And maybe some people would have problem with the social part of it. Yes, and so when we're talking about bringing it back to what the client cares about, yeah. then you have an opportunity to say, okay, this client cares about the environment, so maybe Tesla would be in the, in, in the portfolio, or this client cares mostly about gender equality. So you know, you're applying a different lens. It's what the client cares about and it's building the portfolio stock by stock around exactly that client's It's value true set. customization. Yes. So here's what you like. I'm gonna go find companies that meet those metrics. If those companies don't perform, don't put them in my portfolio. Is it as simple as that? Well, it's really um, like what's the balance? <clears throat> it's trying to it, it is trying to, to mirror the index performance. So whether you're talking about an S and P five hundred or yeah. a Russell one thousand or whatever your underlying index is, you're still mostly owning the industries and the industry weightings, but you're tilting away from the worst companies that the client would disagree with. Yeah, um, and you're recreating the index. So it does. Yes, you're inviting tracking error. If, if a client really is like adamant, I don't want several different industries or exposures to, you could increase the tracking error a little bit, but most of what we've seen has been that the underlying portfolios do closely track the performance of the index. Does it make it so um, oil companies are just not in there because it, they don't have the E part of ESG? If it was a climate change focus for a client or, or the E was the most important factor, then most likely th those would not be included in the portfolio. But an automaker, that's still, it's a lot of, you know, traditional, still gas burning cars, but they're increasingly moving into EV. Like, do you have a conversation with an investor or like, how does something like that? Yeah, um, so we're not making the investment decisions necessarily we're okay. hiring outside managers to do that and they have very um finite data that can bring more to light in that conversation and we can have that conversation with a client um but the data really is quite good and we can show clients you know um here's the companies that would fall into the portfolio and here's what would be cut out how do you feel about that so it's that specific you and can, you can kind yes. of pick and choose yes is, is the the objective you said is to to match the major indices rather than beat them? Yeah, it's, the it's really to track. This is, this is, it's really a passive approach. Okay. Um, there are- uh, With some, net of fees? Uh, so that's gross. Okay. Yeah. Um, the underlying um, indexes, um, I, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. No, that's okay. I'm just wondering about the sales pitch when you're making it to clients. So it's like, okay, we're gonna, in your, in your portfolio, we're gonna have 
your, your portfolio is going to match the index, but it's yeah. going to not include the companies that don't necessarily align with your own values. Right. I was gonna I was gonna mention that. Yeah. And so it's a Monday in August. You are given you a pass. You should have seen us earlier. <laughs> oh is absolutely correct. <laughs> I, was, I was just gonna mention that in some cases, like in that direct indexing yeah. portfolio, you can tilt uh, towards companies that maybe are the leaders on various ESG factors, again, that would be specific to that client, right. but you maybe your portfolio will be more tilted towards you know clean energy or different things like that. So basically an evolution of ESG. Yeah, I think it's, this, is, this has been a huge evolution in the field yeah. in the last like 10 or 15 years, especially the last five. Right. I mean, yeah. And a pushback. Uh, it's kind of fascinating to see. Um, but thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Bud Sturmack, he is partner and head of Impact Investing at Paragon Wealth and Ma uh, Management, joining us right here in our interactive broker studio. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. You and I have been doing this together for quite a while. We have. Including, wow, four years. Yeah, if you think about it, it was the depth or... I mean, oh. of the pandemic. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. Yeah. It really was. Think about back to that environment, if you will. Very um, different. The pandemic was raging. Mm -hmm. Tensions in cities were high. People took to the streets to protest the murder of George Floyd. Around that time, we wrote a lot about this at, at Bloomberg News and at Bloomberg Business Week. A lot of companies and stories about companies, big and small, joining the conversation, making commitments of different types. Mm -hmm. Wells Fargo, one of those companies, four years ago, it committed more than $400 million in non uh, to nonprofits. The idea was to help local businesses that were hit by the pandemic. So the nonprofits would deploy the cash to local businesses. And according to the bank, the vast majority of those businesses, they identified as racially and ethnically diverse. Darlene Goins is head of philanthropy and community impact at Wells Fargo, uh, here to talk a little bit more about what they are up to and how's it, how it is going. She joins us from San Francisco. Darlene, nice to have you here. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to, to check in with you. Um, tell us how things are going. And, you know, four years ago, you guys committed this big chunk of change, 400 million to those nonprofits that uh, really helped out local businesses hit by the pandemic. Where are you in that? And what's been the impact of it? Sure. So let me start by giving some context. So back in 2020, the pandemic hit and immediately millions of small businesses, often those small businesses that help make communities feel like home, they immediately struggled. And so we really wanted to create a national inclusive small business recovery effort. And so we started by listening. We talked with our nonprofit partners that were in communities and asked them what they needed. And they said they needed flexible capital flexible capital that could enable them to pivot to meet whatever the local community's needs were. And so our CEO, Charlie Scharf, decided to donate all of the gross processing fees that Wells Fargo earned from the government for administering the Paycheck Protection Program in 2020. And we created the Open for Business Fund, roughly $420 million that we deployed through flexible grants back into communities to serve small businesses. And if you fast forward then four years, now those more than 200 nonprofits and community development financial institutions are telling us they were able to serve over 336,000 small businesses and help create and preserve more than 461,000 jobs in our local communities. Wow. What does a flexible grant mean? So it means that the nonprofits can use the money in the best way that they need to use it. So for example, they may use it to shore up loan loss reserves so that they can expand their credit box. They may use it to create new products such as um, no and low cost grants or um, loans that um, don't require collateral um, or loan modification products. So they really could use it very flexibly. And I would say that the, what we found successful was in addition to making that capital affordable for small businesses where we had caps on um, interest rates of 3%, um, they paired it with technical assistance. 
those nonprofits and CDFIs delivered 1.1 million hours of technical assistance, more than half of that in a one-on-one -on -one format to those small businesses, many of whom were having to learn how to pivot from providing in-person services to something virtual. And so it really was instrumental in um, being able to help these small businesses through these well, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, we're Bloomberg, we care about metrics, we follow the money and how it's doing, even when it comes to or especially when it comes to philanthropy. Um, if you could, I mean, is it fair to call this philanthropy? Is that how you would describe it? Yes, okay. this was philanthropy. So, um, but go well, ahead. sorry, I just we'd only have a little bit of time. And I want to make sure we, we get to this. I want to know about the metrics when you follow it over the last four years, how how it's been deployed and how it's helped these businesses? Has it been effective? It absolutely has been effective. Um, the great thing was because the nonprofits had this flexible capital and they could shore up their balance sheets, they were able to leverage our funding to attract other public and private investment to the tune of $2.1 billion. And the other great thing is we, we saw from the data that the most in need small businesses were able to stay open. So 79% of the small business owners identified as racially, racially or ethnically diverse, 72% identified as low and moderate income, and 53% were women owned small businesses. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and like a lot of financial institutions or a lot of companies, like they go through cycles and they have their ups and downs. And certainly Wells Fargo's has been well documented over the past years and prior to Charlie Scharf taking over. But one of the things he said is that he wanted to, you know, clean up the bank's many messes. Having said that, what have you guys learned as an institution? How have you evolved in terms of reaching out to you know, those who need to be banked and are underbanked? Well, I think the Open for Business Fund is a perfect example of how we are investing in the entire ecosystem. So when we think about different small businesses, it's important to meet them where they are. And some may need a micro loan, some may need um, a loan from a community development financial institution or CDFI, Others may be ready to engage with a more traditional bank, um, but our investment spans all of those dimensions so that we can best meet small businesses where they are. How do you make sure you reach enough? Like what's the metrics for measuring that? Well, we actually um, exceeded our expectations in going into this um, significantly. So we, ne we knew that we wanted it to be national. We wanted to be able to touch small businesses in every state. We knew that um, we wanted to be able to reach over 150,000 businesses, um, but we exceeded those expectations in being able to reach over 336,000. So um, we are definitely looking at ways that philanthropy can be a catalyst for um, attracting other investment, as well as creating and preserving jobs in the local economy. Does it make you think about making this an ongoing program rather than a one-off program? Uh, definitely, we are focused on what's next right now. Um, in fact, round three of the Open for Business Fund is still ongoing and it's about asset ownership. We recognize that as small businesses are really trying to scale to grow, um, asset acquisition is gonna be really important, whether that is commercial property, or equipment or technological infrastructure for their businesses. And so that piece is ongoing and it will continue through mid next year. And then um, hopefully soon we will have uh, some new news to share about what's next in uh, following the Open for Business Fund. Well, we look forward to that and checking in with you because it's certainly uh, programs like this that help uh, out communities and those that, like we say, that are, are unbanked or underbanked uh, and always important to have. Darlene, thank you so much. Really appreciate you checking in with us on this Monday. Darlene Goins, Head of Philanthropy and Community Impact over at Wells Fargo, joining us from San Francisco. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's going to drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. It's the question that drives us.
This is the drive to the close. That punk to music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody, just about 18 minutes to go until we wrap up the trading day, the first trading day of the week. And because things have kind of, it's not like a week ago last Monday when everybody was using the word panic and concerned about what was going on in the financial markets. It's a much calmer day. And so we wanted to do something a little bit differently. Yeah, we're joined by the CEO of a firm that says it's building AI to help make traders faster. Toggle AI is the company. It's backed by VCs as well as Stan Drunkenmiller and Thomas Petterfee. We should remind you that Thomas Petterfee is the chairman of Interactive Brokers, the sponsor of the Interactive Brokers Studio. We got with us Jan Szilagyi, CEO of Toggle AI. He joins us here in the studio. Jan, good to have you with us. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. So you're doing something pretty cool over at Toggle. You're Apart from, you know, doing you're doing other among the things that you're doing is you're working with Microsoft to build out this chat GPT like LLM for traders to use. What's the vision here? The vision for the team that really comes from the hedge fund background is to create a better platform to take advantage of all the data that we have available to make investing decisions, right? You have research reports, you have time series data, there's just a lot going on every day. For example, just on Bloomberg, you have 18 headlines per second. It's impossible yeah. for humans to absorb all of that and process it. So we've built um, a platform that allows a hedge fund investor to connect the dots faster, understand how things that are moving are impacting different assets they care about. Based on what data? What's the data that goes into this model? So we have a range of different data sources. We have data that come from you know, company fundamentals. We get data from the Federal Reserve. We get data, for example, from various uh, research reports, company filings, company presentations, and so on. It's extremely wide ranging, and that's partly the point because we think that with the help of AI, you're now able to look across all of these different types of data points. So you would essentially create, or the firms that you sell the tool to, would create their own custom LLMs for whatever trades they're working on, right? Because they wouldn't have the same inputs because then it just becomes a commodity whereas everybody has, where everybody has the same analysis of the information. Actually, maybe the way I would um, explain this is that you don't have to have your own custom LLM. We use LLMs primarily as a way to help you navigate our system so that instead of you having to press a button, you can say, okay. I would like to know whether or not fast food restaurants do poorly when gasoline prices rise 10%. Hmm. It's the kind of instruction that you might give to an analyst. And then you rely on the system to go and do the analysis, fetch the data, and then give you the answer. And then you can have a little bit of a back and forth that way. But it relies on our proprietary knowledge graph to be able to connect these dots and say like, oh, actually for gasoline prices, I'll use the first future. And for fast food restaurants, I know which set mm -hmm. of tickers I require. Jan, what would you have done though during the pandemic when all the meme stocks, which most would argue weren't necessarily trading on fundamentals, and it was the retail investor out in a big way. Like how would you, what data would you look at? How would you anticipate or how would you analyze something like that? Yeah, that's a very, different phenomenon to analyze because it obviously is something that hadn't really happened before, not in that kind of way, right? The retail investor mm -hmm. was really seen to have a lot more power than I think people had anticipated. So I would say that in that case, a system like ours would have relied a lot more on some of the sentiment data and some of the news as opposed to, for example, um, price data from 10 years ago and so on. So if there's an event that doesn't have a lot of repeated occurrences, right. you need to be much more focused on things that are happening now on what people are talking about and so on. So, so like social momentum, social velocity? For example, yeah, those would be those would be the types of analysis that you'd be looking at. Now that obviously can be a lot more wrong because right. again, you don't have a lot of prior experiences to say like, oh, I can see what the connection is here. What is the LLM product different from other products that you're building at the company? So Really, we use we use foundational large language models, um, including the ones from OpenAI and others, in order to do two things. We use them to extract information from a variety of different articles, mm -hmm. and then we use them as a way for you to be able to use the analytics engines that are available to all of our users. The 
LLMs themselves are not different from what others might be using, but how we're using them is very different. How do you, you mentioned as an example, giving an LLM a prompt that you would in the past maybe ask an analyst to do. Who are the winners and losers when it comes to jobs here? What's the adjustment here? Does the hedge fund not need that analyst anymore because it has this tool? So in the sort of, we're currently only opening this up to a small number of hedge funds to kind of test the, test the concept. But what we have seen immediately is that actually the analysts benefit because this is the sort of thing that they would have had to do, but where they really shine is trying to be forward thinking. So yes, you have to do the analysis to understand what has happened in the past and have some understanding of the sensitivities, but building a spreadsheet would have taken two, three hours of your time during which maybe you would have been able to do other things. So I think of this as us giving the superpowers to these users rather than replacing them. So augmenting their work. 100%. But you know, I always think about hedge fund guys, men or women or whomever, um, are looking at things differently and have their own special algorithms that lets them find pockets of opportunity in financial markets. If you're creating I'm just curious if that ultimately you're going to be creating data for more people to find those opportunities. Do those opportunities kind of go away? Do you know what I'm saying? That if a lot of people are chasing and getting access, yay, democratization <laughs> of really sophisticated investing strategies, but the more that do it and get that advantage, does that advantage kind of go away? I think this is it's a great question and one that we have to think through very carefully. But I would give you a comparison, for example, with the Bloomberg terminal. By now, everybody in investing industry has one, right? Mm -hmm. And yet there are still opportunities that exist. And you would think, okay, but if everybody has access to the same data, why do we still find these dislocations? Why do people still disagree? Similarly, with the, with the Togo terminal, we are looking specifically at how questions are being asked. And not everybody has the same risk appetite. Not everybody has the same investment horizon. Not True. everybody has the same questions. So the conclusions they arrive at could be very different. All right, got to ask you, only got about 30 seconds. You hold the record for the fastest Harvard economics PhD. How quickly did you get it? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. What does it normally take? I think it's about five. <sighs> How'd you do that? Did you use ChatGPT? <laughs> I wish I had. It probably could have cut that down even more to write the thesis. Or I believe it's Chat PhD. Chat oh. PhD. Ooh. Very, very cool stuff. Um, fun. Let us know how things go. Yeah, I mean, performance-wise, I mean, you guys have back-tested it? You did doing the strategy? Does it the we, test, we back-test it every day, basically, for all the insights and so on. And so there's a lot of curation that goes into that. Very good. Very cool stuff. Jan, thank you so much. Look forward to continuing this conversation. Jan Salaji, he is Chief Executive Officer of Toggle AI, joining us right here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.